Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is John Gleer. I'm the chief executive of Grins about Gleer, based here in Chicago. And we are absolutely delighted to have, have over, I think, 800 of our professional colleagues with us today. I want to welcome uh, Mark Llewellyn today. Welcome, Mark. Thanks for being with us. Thanks for the invite, John. Right. It's, uh, it's, I'm delighted to have you here with us today. You and I have known one another for quite some time, Mark, and I've had the great privilege of working with you at UVA. Um, I want to begin this session by saying just a few words of introduction to our guest, uh, of our guest, Mark, um, and then getting right to a number of questions. All of you have his resume um, uh, as background, so you've seen it. I'm not going to go through all of it. But let me start with saying that Mark has now served as the Vice President for Advancement at the University of Virginia since May of 2016. Mark arrived at UVA in 2014 uh, from Penn State, where he spent a number of years um, in the College of Liberal Arts, first as an Associate Director, then as Director of Major Gifts, and finally as Director of Alumni Relations, Communications and Development for the College of Liberal Arts surpassing its $113 million component goal of the Penn State campaign. Today, Mark, in fact, serves across uh, a rather extraordinary range of programs and initiatives, as well as, uh, as a leader of the $5 billion philanthropic campaign now underway, Honor the Future. He provides overall leadership for advancement programs and initiatives across the university. He works with school and foundation leaders to identify campaign priorities and to define strategies, fundraising strategies in every part of the school uh, across grounds. Um, Mark also serves in a number of roles as part of the university leadership team. He serves as the president's representative on numerous leadership boards, including university associated organization, architecture, education, health, commerce, and athletics, and sits on the board of the UVA Foundation. Um, but uh, let me finally say, uh, Mark, in fact, comes from Pennsylvania, received his bachelor's degree from Allegheny College, and a graduate certificate in project management from Penn State. He and his wife, Beth Ann, and their two daughters reside in Rutgersville, Virginia. Welcome, Mark. Thanks for being with us. Thanks, John. Appreciate those kind words. All right. So uh, let's also say to everyone that Mark has very graciously agreed to take questions on our chat system. Uh, unfortunately, we won't have time to take live questions today, but Mark has graciously agreed to uh, address any question that's sent in and we'll post the ans Mark's, Mark's answers to those questions uh, when uh, in fact uh, we get them and post them over the next couple of days. So. Let me start, Mark, with just a couple of questions about UVA's advancement structure. I know there are a lot of uh, colleagues out there that would like to better understand the scale of uh, the program, what kind of fundraising totals it's had over the last three years, how it's organized across grounds, as UVA describes its campus, and some of the changes that it's moved through as it's moved into the campaign and then we'll get on to the campaign itself. Great, thanks, John. I think that, that question of itself could probably take a full hour, so I will, I will try to be brief here in my uh, summary. Um, in Virginia, our advancement operation is, is a little over 500 employees across the entire grounds, as John said, and that includes all support staff, alumni relations, professionals, development staff, you name it. Um, you know, the, the structure is a bit unique within higher education. Uh, many of you have uh, independent foundations or may have one or two uh, foundations at, at your institution. Um, we have a, a total of 23 different, as we call them, university affiliated organizations. Um, and about 17 of those are fundraising uh, organizations. They're separate 501c3s um, with, as John mentioned, a, a close connection and collaboration with the university. Uh, we sit on the president has a representative on each one of those foundations so uh it's but it's also a, a strong hybrid organization is what i like to refer to it as in the sense that we have a, a lot of great colleagues and structure and alumni engagement at the unit level through a number of the foundations 
but also in, in central advancement as well. And, and that, that's about an even split uh, budgetarily these days. Um, when you look at uh, the total enterprise to answer John's question, our 10 year run rate at Virginia in total commitments is about 300, a little over $380 million. Um, the last three years due to the generosity of so many and our great team, our average run rate has, has grown to be about 650 million in total commitments the last three years. So we did uh, 565 million three years ago, 850 last year and uh, 530 this past year. Uh, so uh, very, very strong support from our alumni base across grounds. Really uh, an interesting data point that, that John has, uh, likes to repeat often. Um, a lot of people around the ground support many different areas. I think one of the data points that John said, which is kind of unique to Virginia, is our average donor over $100,000 in lifetime giving typically supports about 13 areas of the university. So uh, important for collaboration and coordination across the enterprise uh, with all of our different groups. Um, you think about what's changed. I mean, there's a lot changed. We've had a great legacy and history of philanthropy at Virginia over the years, but I think there have been a, a couple key points in the last few years is, that have been helpful in a campaign. Um, one would be the point that I mentioned before about greater collaboration and coordination. Um, that has really been an area we've invested a lot of time in and a lot of resources as well to, to better link all the different areas of the university, which has been helpful in how we think about larger commitments, uh, which is my second point. Uh, larger commitments have, uh, have been more a regular occurrence at UVA in, re in recent years. Uh, an example of that has been just endowed chairs as an example of that. Um, you know, we were probably averaging four or five endowed chairs a few years ago. And over the last couple of years, we did about 100 endowed chairs uh, combined across the university. Um, and also around centers and institutes and other, other big ideas. So, so Mark, let me just interrupt you for a second. You've, you've yeah. raised a really important issue, some of these larger commitments that have come because of the campaign. We'll get on to the campaign in a minute. But yeah. Talk about those endowed chairs and what helped generate those endowed chairs. Yeah, that's a good question, John. Um, as I said before, you know, we were averaging probably four or five endowed chairs across the grounds up until a few years ago that weren't uh, through a deferred gift of some, some mechanism. These were outright commitments. And this was an area, as, as we're all seeing a generational shift in our faculty that we wanted to double down on a bit more and, and put greater emphasis. So one of the things our board of visitors, uh, which is our governing board, uh, supported was the creation of a matching fund program where we match with institutional funds from the endowment uh, commitments that are made to endow chairs. And, and they range depending on the time, you know, we, we've modified it a little bit over time, um, but that has been a real leverage point to have, you know, frankly, skin in the game with our donors and show that this was a really important area for us. So whether it be the Darden School or our co the college or, or what have you, uh, we've just seen tremendous growth in this area. And I think our donors have viewed it as a partnership. So we've, you know, on average, uh, as of right now, you know, we will match uh, commitments over $2 million, uh, 50 cents on the dollar. And so it's a significant match and those funds go in as donors fulfill their commitment. Um, but again, it's been a way for us to show a, a significant uh, importance in this area. And, and as I mentioned, I think in the last uh, 24 months, we've endowed 100 chairs. So uh, that's been a big, big help to our academic enterprise as well as to look to recruit. Thanks, Mark. That's really interesting to know. And it's one of the great strengths of the UVA campaign. Yeah. Um, move to the campaign now and talk a little bit about how you got, how you organized it and how it's moved forward um, when it launched and what its target is. Yeah, as John mentioned earlier, our, our fundraising target for this campaign is $5 billion. Our last campaign was three, uh, which was a great success uh, around the grounds. Um, we launched our campaign publicly last fall. Our goal was to be a little over halfway, and we were there. Uh, I think we were at 2.75 when, when we launched, um, maybe 2.7 in that range. Uh, we're now at about, we're now just shy of $3.2 billion in the campaign. Um, and and it's, it's gone really well. It's, you know, it was a bit of a transition. Um, we started the campaign under President Sullivan and, his, and uh, transitioned to President Ryan. Uh, but that, that transition went extremely well and really gave us an opportunity to look at new areas of priorities around the grounds and really let the president start to shape 
this campaign the way he wanted to, in addition to our deans. So, um, you know, we've worked through pan university priorities as well as school and unit priorities. I would say originally uh, at the beginning, our school and unit priorities were a little more defined somewhat because of the transition, but the transition worked well because, as I said, because we went through a university wide strategic planning process that went very quickly. Um, we all know those things some, can sometimes take years, but we, we were able to complete this in, in under a year, which should really help the campaign and kind of formalize what some of the things are that we were going to emphasize in this campaign. If you could point to um, any one or two of the key challenges that you faced in moving forward with this campaign and getting to the numbers that you've obviously achieved to date, Mark, what have they been? What's characterized this campaign? Yeah, you know, I think one of the things that's been really helpful in this campaign, and John provided, I'll, I'll give a little bit of a plug for John, um, was really thinking about how we were funding and structuring this campaign. Um, we hadn't we we hadn't funded some of our previous fundraising the way we needed to, and we really created a diversified funding stream that allowed us to invest in the center, uh, also have support from the school and units, and and also have central support. So. Well, the diversified funding, particularly now, is, is extremely important, but it's allowed us to build out our gift planning program a lot more. It's allowed us to build out our uh, uh, principal gift program a lot more and invest in technology and, and internal resources that, that we didn't have as much in the past. So I think that has been one. I think the other one has been the engagement of senior leadership uh, across the grounds in this campaign particularly our president and our provost, uh, both who are new and our COO over the last uh, couple years. Um, we have a much closer relationship with our provost's office and thinking through the academic priorities. And our president really, I give a lot of credit to President Ryan, he really hit the road immediately when he became president and invested a significant amount of time uh, in our fundraising efforts, both in, around strategy and on uh, direct donor engagement. So um, that, that, that transition, we, we kind of had the, the one-two punch of his inauguration and transition right into a campaign launch a year later. And so it gave us a lot of momentum here the last couple of years. You had transitions with the provost and the COO as well, right? We did. That's correct. Yeah. Okay. Um, so talk just for a minute about campaign leadership. Your volunteer leadership played an important role in this campaign. Tell us about that. No, it's a, thanks, John. Um, it's it's a, been an extremely important part for us. Um, you know, because of the presidential transition, um, one of the things that we invested a lot of time in early on was really selecting our chair. And Virginia has a history of having chairs that uh, are really engaged for the duration of the campaign. They serve in that role for a long time. But we, we went through an exhaustive process, um, really at the direction of the board, to really do uh, a lot of discussions, of far more than probably we've done in the past about who that person should be. I think I ended up having 120 individual discussions with stakeholder groups individually about who our chair should be and the characteristics and the qualities and the type of person. And we, we were really blessed to have Peter Grant uh, serve as our campaign chair. Peter is um, a double who, four of his kids have gone here. Um, I, I, with all due respect to the institutions on the phone, I, I can't imagine a volunteer chair who is more engaged than Peter. Uh, you know, he travels with us to every road show, every presidential event, Peter, Peter goes with us. He attends foundation meetings, every board of visitors meeting. Um, it's staggering that he's able to do this as a volunteer, but he's really been a partner of mine and a partner of the president's the whole way through the process. Uh, but we also have a really strong campaign executive committee and uh, two honorary chairs, uh, Malcolm Brogdon, uh, and Martha Karsh, who uh, have helped us in different constituency groups that we, in, from regional to athletics to what have you, that, that we didn't have in the past. And we recognize Martha's name from uh, Duke and Penn, where the Karsh family has been deeply involved in campaigns yep. nationally. So, um, so uh, before we actually turn to COVID and how your staff has pivoted, particularly in the midst of a campaign. Mark, uh, talk for a minute about a rather unique structure at UVA um, that uh, got established a number of years ago uh, by your predecessor, Bob Sweeney, and you have grown it and invested in it significantly, and that is the Office of Engagement. Tell our audience how that works and what its remit is 
because it, uh, it plays an essential role as we move forward and talk a little bit about COVID. No, John, that's a good, that's a good point. Thanks for bringing it up. No, we have an office of engagement with, which directly reports to me. We also have an independent alumni association, which we have a strong partnership with. And in hand in hand, they work together at how do we engage our constituents outside of fundraising. Uh, the Alumni Association focuses a lot on what we do here on the grounds and our engagement office, which is chaired by Cindy Frederick, who I, I'm sure some of you know, Cindy's pretty well known in the industry, um, looks at our clubs, our um, lifetime learning and different areas of our engagement opportunities. And she also oversees annual giving uh, at the university wide level as well. Um, but you know, I think it's been really important for us as we looked at how how did we pivot to your point? I, I always use the point that I think advancement professionals have to be the master of the pivot. And I think nothing has tested that more than the last couple months. Um, I'll use an example of this with Cindy and her team. Um, you know, we, we traditionally have about 1200 engagement events a year, um, no matter what format those are, but most of those are done in person. And, you know, if you go back to last year, um, we had a ton of events in the spring tied to our, our run for the national championship. And all those were in person in different cities across the country. Um, what's staggering is we were able to do uh, actually engage more people this year, even though we're in a different environment and we aren't running for a national championship. But it was it was all done virtually. And Cindy and her team did a did 158 events between March and the end of June. And what was staggering about it is we actually engaged about 62,000 people who registered for different events. So it was really a great way for us. I mean, they went, they went to action right away, but it even goes further than that, John, which we'll hit on here in a minute, is really how everyone leaned in and, and you know, went above and beyond. I mean, we had staff assistants making calls. We, had, we actually used our phone-a-thon, not on outbound uh, solicitations because they weren't here, but in stewardship calls as a way to engage people. So we, we really used every possible arrow we had in our quiver to continue the momentum here over the last couple of months. Yeah, so let me ask you about one. You had um, a very well-known event as you launched the campaign, um, the Run with Jim everywhere. Yeah, yeah. And I'm told that you actually figured out how to do a virtual one. Tell us about that. And no, tell us what the Run with Jim is. Yeah, so our, our new president uh, is a marathon runner and really enjoys running. And one of the things we thought that we could do was how could we engage the president with uh, stakeholders here in Charlottesville, but also uh, around the country as we traveled. And as I said before, the president spent a significant amount of time on the road with us. And so on every trip that we would have, it started here just on grounds as a dare, uh, frankly, from one of our students to the president to say, hey, you want to run? Uh, I'd like to go for a run with you as part of my bucket list before I graduate. And the president responded in social media and said, anyone who wants to show up Tuesday morning at 7 a.m. and we'll go for a run. Well, that first morning we had about 150 people show up for a run. So we started taking that on the road. And so I, I never thought we would have a, someone who actually planned out routes for runs as part of our uh, road show, but we did. We actually have someone who goes and maps out a run route and you know, the morning after a big event, the president goes on a run. And it's really been a way to engage parents, it's a way to engage alums in just a more authentic and casual way. Um, and so they get t-shirts, we bring in uh, bagels from a local place in Charlottesville that everyone loves. And it's really been a fun event. So we looked in partnership with the president's office and Matt Weber, who is in the president's office, a good partner of ours, uh, looked at working with how to create a virtual run. So people all across the, the country could run and they could send in pictures. Um, the president you know, took pictures along the way of his run across the grounds. And so it was a way to continue to do the same type of thing, but have a lot of engagement over social media as people participate in their own way. That's great, Mark. Um, so let's go to COVID particularly. I know your staff scrambled just like everybody else. Any uh, comments or observations you would make uh, as the, as the team uh, adapted to the pandemic we've all been living with for the last four or five months? Yeah, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a good question, John. You know, I think that um, you know, everybody approached this around the country and around the world in different ways, and I don't, I'm not sure there's a right or wrong answer. You know, some <laughs> backs, others uh, looked at, you know, investing more. 
you know, I think one of the things we decided early on, especially after our students left, was how do we how do we lean in more and and uh, do a better job of tracking all of our outreach and really focus on relationships. And so, you know, I'm really proud of our team across the university. I think if there's been a time when we've collaborated more than ever, it's been it's been during this. And you know, I, I looked, I haven't looked in the last week, but I think uh, since early March and up until last week, I think we've documented over 60,000 individual outreaches to people. That could be a Zoom call, that could be a, a phone call, it could be a text, but everyone did a really good job of documenting their activity and, and just reaching out and checking in on people, um, but also opening up gift conversations as well. Um, obviously, we were sensitive to that. We did put a hold on the annual fund and outreach across the university in the early stages, but slowly brought that back, um, wanting to make sure people were sensitive to how they had their outreach and what they wrote and who the messages came from, including from the president. But those, but we were really sensitive to it, but we still, we still pushed to get out there. And I have to say, if you would ask me in early March, if we would have hit our target, which was half a million, half a billion dollars for the year, I would have been pretty skeptical, um, but I have to say that not only did we hit it, but what it was also really impressive was June is our usually our second highest month of the year. It's the last month in our fiscal year, and we were up in cash twenty almost twenty eight percent over last year. So I think some of that definitely is is can be attributed to the hard work and outreach of the team, but also in the work we've done over the last couple of years. You know, I think making sure that. We're ramping up our conversations on major gifts and making sure those gifts are fulfilled um, has been important. And you know, I, I have to say, I think we we actually our pledge reminders that gave people the opportunity to reach out to me directly if they needed to renegotiate their their gift terms. And and I haven't received one call. Um, I, I think we've only re renegotiated one or two total across the grounds, and they were pretty small. So it's been it's been staggering to see how. Our alums have responded, our parents have responded, but I think a, a large, uh, large recognition goes to the staff, as, as I mentioned, both in engagement and also on the fundraising side of the operation. And, and I so, would be remiss if I didn't add the president. Um, you know, those 60,000 outreaches were a lot, but we had hundreds of individual outreaches from our president. So whether it be calling, texting, um, phone calls, you, you name it. He did it. And I think we also did a, a series of leadership seminars, which built off our engagement, which were just the top donors, where we would bring the president in to be interviewed uh, by an alumnus, very private, 40, 50 people, like we would do in person. We did that with the provost, we did it with the head of the health system, we did it with our head football coach, we did it with the AD, um, we did it with our COO. So we've done it with a lot of people, and, and that's been really, really important. Uh, that's really quite extraordinary, Mark. So clearly the momentum that the campaign had generated in 2019 going th into 2020, you were able to sustain by pivoting to a far more proactive engagement posture. Let let's talk about uh, the uncertainty that remains in front of us. We're all challenged by it. Um, tell us a little bit about your thinking, you and your team, about the coming year and the kinds of goals you're setting right now. Can you sustain this level? You've got a, you've got a big chunk of campaign left in front of you. Um, what are you facing in the coming year? Yeah, you know, I think John, I'll jump back to the, the COVID uh, point before uh, on one additional point. You know, I think that one of the things that's also been really helpful to us is an overwhelming support by our board and our volunteers. I mean, these close relationships we've developed and our finance office, quite, quite honestly, I know sometimes their uh, organiz advancement organizations have, have uh, relationships that can be challenging sometimes with finance or with operations. But if anything, people are really cheering us on. Um, and, and over and over again, the, the common lingo that was shared was, do you have the information you need to be able to share with donors? So they were very transparent very forward looking on everything that we were doing to make sure that we had the information which we needed, which again was, made all the difference when we were, you know, trying to have these ongoing dialogues. Um, you know, I think the, the comment you, you raised about the future is an interesting one. Um, you know, I, we have not finalized our goal for the upcoming year yet. We are in final discussions over that. You know, I will say it's a bit of a mixed bag. Um, somewhat psychologically and philosophically, um, you know, that there has been a lot of encouragement by my senior team 
to be bold and ambitious. Um, our alums are competitive like alums of any institution, and they want us to continue with that rate of momentum that we've built up. Um, but obviously there's a tremendous amount of uncertainty. And so this balancing act between how do we keep everyone focused and, and focused on the work that we're doing and getting them to stretch and think strategically, but at the same time, understand there's probably gonna be an asterisk against this year that we just don't know between the elections, between COVID, you name it. Um, I think it's gonna put even uh, a greater emphasis on strategy, John, um, and not just tactics. You know, I think it's easy for us to say, we're gonna have a bunch of events, <laughs> we're gonna have a bunch of outreach, but are we having the right outreach? Are we having the right engagement? Are we having the right dialogue? And so one of the things we're focusing a lot on right now is really who are the people that we want to talk about really significant gifts this year. Um, who are the best people? Who are the, what is the way to do it in our new environment? Um, and really thinking longer term about some of these that maybe due to the increases in the markets and everything else in the past that we we benefited from, we just may or may not have those in the next year or two or a couple of years. So, you know, I think it's, it's forcing us to be doing what we should be doing, but doing it a lot more strategically and a lot more focused. So let me push you to the issue of lessons learned, Mark. Uh, what have we learned about this virtual environment? Let's, uh, propose, let's suppose for a moment that we're gonna continue in this environment for a while. What have we learned uh, about this pivot, the reach or even the efficiency of what we've done? Uh, are there any conclusions you and your team have drawn around this? I'm not sure if we've come to any conclusions and I'm sure there's many, many people on this phone that have had ideas that, are, that have resonated better than even what we've done. Um, but, you know, I would say a couple of things, John, that come to mind in that question. Um, one would be uh, the importance of authenticity and deep relationships. You know, I think, um, as I mentioned here a minute ago, I think we all can brag about, hey, we kept the events going, we kept everything going, but are we having the candor in those conversations that we would have had if we were in person. I think that's a challenge to all of us. How do we plan appropriately? Like, like we would for an event, we think about talking points. We think about who's sitting, sitting next to who. We think about how do we stimulate conversation? Are we doing that enough in a virtual environment? I, I would say, I don't think we are. Uh, and that's not a criticism, but I think it's a challenge that we gotta uh, reach even further and, and not just do quantity, but quality. Uh, but I, I will tell you the relationship aspect of this has been the second point. I would say, um, you know, people want inside baseball. There's so much going on at, in, higher, in the world right now, but particularly in higher ed. And, you know, there's, there's a daily article, not just in our trade magazines, but in the New York Times, in the Washington Post, you name it, about higher ed. And people want to know what we're thinking, how we're thinking about it. And, and they, want, they want honesty. They want not canned responses, not just a free bar, but they want something that's really meaningful. And I think um, that's hard because it, it's, again, changing by the day, if not the hour. But I think we're constantly having to think about, and I think it'll force us to be better at our jobs. Um, you know, while we learned this, and this is something we need to communicate, and how do we distribute this, not just in a mass email, but how do we pick up the phone and make 50 telephone calls today? Um, so I think this return, a greater focus on authenticity, a greater focus on planning and thoughtfulness, I think is it's probably a reboot and a refresh that we all need. Uh, but we should be thinking about that as our goals. We should think about it as our priorities, just simply across the map. So Mark, let me just ask you, as um, uh, given the broad, range of gift officers you have out there uh, and it's a question we get a lot do you believe your team can in fact launch instigate and start new relationships in the midst of this virtual engagement environment we find ourselves in is it more than just the pipeline relationships we've had in the past can we start new ones uh i i think i don't think we have a choice john um i think it's i think yes is it a challenge absolutely um, you know, especially the way we've been trained. We, we like to be together. It's the, the, the way we've been trained. It's the way we all like to interact. Um, and there's just something about Zoom with all its benefits that just isn't there in, 
you know, sitting and having a cup of coffee with someone or having, having dinner or sitting in someone's office. It's just a different environment. I think it's going to, I think there's going to, I think we're going to have to be really creative, John, um, and not just look at wealth screenings or not just look at these type of things, but really think about how do we find that right nugget of information. You know, I, I'll, do, I'll share something we've been working on, which you're a little familiar with. Instead of just the mass communications that we send out around fundraising and the impact of fundraising, um, we've really started to develop toolkits where there are articles and resources for the fundraisers so they can send things and see what, you know, just in regular contact with people. I saw this article and I thought of you. It could be about academics, it could be about athletics, it could be whatever, and see what resonates with people. We had, we had someone the other day that we, we know well, but hasn't been philanthropic. And we sent him one of these articles and that day he committed to a major gift verbally. And, and that was the trigger point that, that really uh, got him to focus. So I think it's, it's new and it's different. I also think we need to lean on our volunteers more. Um, you know, many of these people have 40 and 50 year marriages with the institution. They know people, they know who has made money in this environment, who has suffered in this environment. And I think we need to go back to grassroots a little bit and really lean on our volunteers to say, can you make these 10 introductions for me? So we're not just asking for money and we're not just asking for advice, but we're saying, who are the top five people you think I should be talking to? And are you willing to make introductions to them? I think it's, I think it's gotta be more grassroots than just simply cold calling it hot. Yeah, so Mark, that's terrific advice for our audience. Alas, we are out of time here and I knew it would go quickly. Um, thank you, Mark. Uh, this has been really splendid. I want to remind everybody who's still listening that we are happy to take questions, uh, send them in, um, and Mark has graciously agreed to answer them, and we will post them by tomorrow or, or the next couple of days, let me say. Um, also, feel free to reach out uh, uh, to Mark directly. Um, I'm sure he would welcome any questions. Uh, you can reach him clearly on LinkedIn uh, as well. Uh, do feel free to reach out to me as well on LinkedIn or even to my email address here at uh, GGNA. We're happy to be helpful in any way we can. But let me close by saying thank you once again to Mark uh, for being with us and sharing with us so directly some of your experience over the last uh, several years at UVA. Thank you, Mark. Thanks, John. I'm glad to glad have anyone who has questions. Thanks. Uh, we welcome all questions. Thanks, everyone. Bye for now.